uh, thanks for, all for coming. Uh, so it's my distinct pleasure today to introduce Dr. Masa Dadar, who's a new faculty member at the Douglas, uh, also in the Department of Psychiatry. Mm -hmm. uh, so Masa, actually, you know, I share um, a similar lineage, and we, we did our PhD in the same lab uh, a few years apart. Um, and Massa just finished a uh, PhD at the Montreal Neurological Institute under the supervision of Louis Collins, and then went on to do a postdoctoral fellowship uh, jointly at University of Laval and University of Alberta. Um, and we're lucky enough to have her here as a new faculty member as of January. Uh, she's an expert in a great many things, including image processing, machine learning as it pertains to image processing and image analysis. Um, and of course, using all these tools to help us understand aging and neurodegenerative disorders. So uh, thanks Mas, for taking on this talk and she's gonna give us a bit intro to structural image processing um, and some tips and tricks around that. Thanks a lot, Mas. Perfect, thank you. So yeah, last week you heard a bit about how to look at different questions using features that are extracted, for example, from MRIs. Now this week is going to be about how do we get how how do we extract features from MRI data and how do we make sure that the features that we are extracting and generating are good quality features that are actually trustable and can be used. So, yep, right out of the scanner, um, you may do your own data collection or you may um, start by downloading data from some publicly publicly available repositories. The data looks very different. You can see that in the image ranges, for, for example, are very different. You almost don't see the two images that are on the left. This figure has all of the images with the same um, intensity ranges. I'm gonna get rid of some of that. And basically, even after uh, kind of matching the intensity ranges, you can see that the quality of the images are very different. Sometimes the subject, when, it's, uh, when they are positioned in the scanner, they are looking up, you see the nose. So there's a lot of rotation, head tilting to different sides. You have intensity in homogeneity, you have missing field of view, you might be missing a bit of the cerebellum or brain stem or the top of the cortex, depending on how the subject is positioned. You sometimes, a lot of the times with um, aging and dementia populations, you have uh, motion artifacts. So there are a lot of different types of issues that you have to figure out first of all and, as, and assess how much, is, um, how much your data set is impacted and if you can get rid of any of it. So yeah, MRI artifacts are basically variations in the MRI signal that you don't want to have. They are not related to any, anything that is specific to your subject's brain anatomy, for example, and they are things that you don't want to have in your uh, MRI features. The first one is noise, basically random variability in the intensity of the images that you're getting that doesn't have anything to do with the anatomy of your subject. It can be due, due to a different um, set of resources, but in general, um, that's how it, in noisy images can look. The other one is intensity in homogeneity, which is in general the smooth variability in the intensity of the image that you're seeing. And it can look very different in MRIs that come from different scanners, different field strengths and protocols. There can be motion. If you look at this, the third image, uh, you see the, um, this is called ringing or motion artifact. Basically, you're seeing the contours of the skull when the subject moves their head. Um, there is magnetic susceptibility if someone has um, something metal on them that would severely impact the quality of the MRI signal and that's not recoverable. There can be a spike artifact, which is basically, this is how it looks. I'm gonna try to keep the mass to the minimum, but basically if you have bad data points in your case space, what your um, transform image is, looks like this and is not usable most of the time. And then there is wraparound arti artifact. When you have a small field of view, you end up seeing uh, the ghost of the nose of the subject, for example, here or the top of the skull, if your acquisition is um, axial. So how do we deal with this? We look at our images visually and assess the quality and make sure that we don't use data that is not usable. Um, that is the first step that is very important, like quality control your data, exclude cases that are hopeless. If you have um, 
missing field of view, if you want to study the cerebellum and the image doesn't have the cerebellum fully covered, there's nothing you can do about that. You can't recover it. So you need to exclude cases that are hopeless. But you should always consider when you're quality controlling what your application is. If you have, for example, limited field of view, if you're missing a part of the cerebellum, but your question, the question that you're answering doesn't have anything to do with the cerebellum, for example, you're looking at some, some sort of like cortical feature or lesions, you might be able to be a bit more lenient and pass cases that are missing cerebellum. You don't care about that. There's also a lot of pipeline dependence. Some, pipe, some pipelines are a lot better than hand, in handling some sort of and sorts of artifact than others. So you should always consider the question that you're trying to answer before excluding too many subjects. Um, this is a um, QC software that um, Sophia from Louis Collins's lab has developed. What I like about it is that you generate your own type of QC images, and this is just to allow different users to QC the data and label it and um, use whatever type of QC images they like. But basically, you need a software to QC, and you need to look at the data that you have to make sure the quality is good. I was talking about pipeline dependence, especially when you have multimodal data, it might be that you have low quality images, but it works. You should always consider what your application is. I'm not gonna say, I'm not, I'm not saying you should use data that is this poor quality um, just because you think it might work, but you might always like always think that it's possible that I would do another round of QC and look at my final segmentations and see if those are good enough, even though there is a lot of errors in the data that I have. For example, this subject has a lot of motion artifacts, but if the final date segmentations that you're interested in are not really impacted by it, you might want to be more lenient, especially since um, I'm going to come back to it, but basically when you have um, data from older people, people with dementia, people with, for example, Parkinson's disease, they're going to move. So basically, you should always think about the fact that you might be biasing your data set if you're being too stringent on your QC um, criteria. For example, if you want to get rid of any, like the most subtle amount of motion, then what, what ends up happening is that if you're looking at Parkinson's versus control populations, you're going to fail almost all of your Parkinson's patients. So um, I'm not saying that you shouldn't remove people that have motion, but always think about your problem and think about how much you're biasing your data and think about how much of the data you could be saving maybe um, if you use different pipelines before failing everything. And as I mentioned, some measures are a lot more sensitive to motion than artifacts, for example, like overall segmentation, like brain segmentation, brain volume measures are not as sensitive to some artifacts than um, measurements such as like block cell wise deformation based morphometry. So basically you download your data, you have your MRIs, you try to do image pre-processing to get as much of the artifacts, um, get rid of as much of the artifacts as possible. And you wanna standardize your images and by that, I mean, you wanna make sure that the heads are, the brains are positioned in the same location so that when you're extracting your features, you would be um, confident, relatively confident to say, okay, this voxel in this specific X, Y, Z location, corresponds to the same structure in the brain for all of the subjects that I have pre-processed and registered. So the idea is that you do uh, pre-processing, denoising, intensity, non-uniformity correction, and intensity normalization. Then you do linear registration. Then sometimes you do non-linear registration as well and extract some sort of, some sort of segmentation uh, based volumetrics or deformation based morphometry feature. So this figure shows the same person um, we call we call these nice people that go around and get a scan in a lot of different types of the scanner with different sequences, traveling phantoms. So this is Simon Duchenne for those that know him. Uh, scanned in, he has been a scanned in more than a hundred different scanners with different um, sequences. And basically, what we have is the brain scan of the same person 
with a lot of different sequences and uh, scanners. And what you can see, what you can appreciate from these figures is that there's a lot of variability. If you just go and apply your segmentation, for example, method to these images, there's going to be a lot of variability in the measurements that you're extracting just because the scanners are different. There are differences in the quality of the images, levels of noise, patterns of non-uniformity. I've already corrected a lot of the intensity um, range differences, but you can even appreciate that there are differences there. You can also see there is differences between gray and white matter contrast, for example, levels in different images. So we wanna do pre-processing and by that, I mean, we wanna try to make these images as close, like as similar to each other as possible because any differences between those um, are not anything that are related to the subjects and atoms. Mean, these are just a scanner related differences. So this is what we in general mean by pre-processing. This is what we want to have after uh, our images are pre-processed. As I mentioned, the first step is denoising. Um, a lot of the pre-processing steps are um, dependent on, again, the application that you have. I'm gonna get back, come back to that. But basically denoising is getting rid of the in intensity variability, intensity noise that you have to um, improve image quality and performance of the downstream pipelines. The image on the left here is their own image without any denoising. And then the two images on the right are images that have different levels of denoising. The second row shows um, tissue classification, which is a very simple type of segmentation applied to these different images. And you can, um, if you look at the red arrows, you can see that you have like random boxes segmented as gray matter, um, just because you haven't denoised the image. And if you do a good um, denoising on the, uh, on the images, initial images, your output segmentations are going to be uh, a lot better. But there's always, um, you can always denoise too much. And by that, I mean, you can force the data so much it, that it might look nice, but you're starting to lose information. If you look at the cortex and uh, for example, the sulfur and gyroid, this is step inside um, in the cortical areas, you can see that the sharpness, the contrast has been reduced. So what ends up happening is that your resulting segmentation would be a lot coarser as well if you do too much denoising. As I mentioned, it's, um, it's always application dependent. If you're looking for um, detecting very small, for example, lesions, very small uh, structures, you might not want to denoise because even a small amount of denoising might make the borders blurry enough that it would be too difficult to detect your um, pathology of interest or structure of interest. So, in general, you might want to go for higher higher levels of false positive that you can post process out in um, one way or another, uh, as opposed to denoising in the beginning and make your making your problems uh, more difficult. Second step is intensity non uniformity correction. Again, um, it refers to removing. Um, as much of the inten um, intensity variation, smooth intensity variation across the image as you can. It might, it usually is impossible to get rid of all of it, um, but you want to do the best you can with the data set that you can. So, um, and by that, I mean different data sets might have different um, parameters that you need to use for your you know, um, non uniformity correction technique, and you always want a QC afterwards to make sure that your um, non-uniformity correction is doing the job it's supposed to be doing. For example, here, this image has been, oh, here, this image has been overcorrected. So what it means is that your correction pipeline actually introduced more variability into the image and you end up seeing the result in the segmentation. So it's, it actually makes the outputs worse. Uh, so you always want to QC your um, pre-processing steps as well to make sure that the parameters that you're using are correct for the data set that you have. The last one is intensity normalization. Uh, basically, images that come out of different um, scanners might look very different. This is again seen on the same subject. Um, each row is a different um, 
is a, is his scan in a different scanner. And you can see, for example, the gray to white contrast is very different. So you can do different uh, levels of linear or, or nonlinear intensity normalization. And basically the idea is that in the image on the right, for example, the gray to white contrast is a lot more similar in the top and bottom rows. Um, whereas the, in the one in the left, they are, there is a lot of difference. And this is going to impact your downstream segmentation pipeline. One other point that I should mention is always use brain masks when you're doing uh, intensive normalization. You don't want anything that is outside of the brain to impact your intensive normalization. For example, some people have vitamin pills, some people have um, are wearing something or um, for in, in the case of people that are a bit more obese, the fat signal in the cheeks or in the neck or in the shoulder might impact the intensive normalization a lot. And this is not something you wanna have. So always use brain masks when you're doing intensive normalization. But I mentioned you can do linear, a very simple linear intensive normalization. You can do more sophisticated nonlinear intensive normalizations as well. And this is, how it looks. Um, so for normal subjects, this might be a good idea. It might work and actually make your images a lot more consistent across different scanners, but you should always think about your application. If you're having data from old, uh, older individuals with a lot of different types of pathology, that pathology might actually impact your intensive normalization results. So what you end up doing is, for example, look at the CSF intensity that how much it's changed and it's not as dark as it used, used to be here or in the um, healthy normal subjects, what ends up happening is that your intensity normalization might actually throw off your intensity ranges enough that it would impact your segmentation results. And you should always think about this when you're looking at disease populations. Is there any type of pathology reflected in my images that might impact my pre-processing steps? So after you pre-process your images, you wanna have everything in the same space and position the subjects, you wanna have the subjects positioned in the same space roughly as much as possible. So that's why you do linear registration. Linear registration in general aligns the two images to each other through a linear transformation. And by linear transformation, I mean a combination of translation and rotation, scaling and shearing. Um, many people, don't do shearing um, when they do linear registration, it's a choice. Uh, but in general, that's, that's what you call linear registration. When you're registering two different sequences for the same subjects, um, two different modalities, you usually don't use a scaling because for example, if you're registering, co-registering your T1 weighted and T2 weighted images, the head should be the same. It's the same scanning session, it's the same subject. So, you want to have your, it's always in the end uh, an optimization problem. So you want to have uh, as few parameters to optimize as possible. You don't want to introduce additional noise to your data. And that's why we usually don't do shearing because the more parameters you have, the more chance you have to um, get to a wrong local optimum. But basically the image here on the right, is the two um, brains overlaid without linear registration. You can see that the size of the head is very different and they are not like, for example, ventricles are roughly the same space, but the cortex is completely, uh, is completely in different uh, place. Um, the cortex of one brain is uh, overlaid on the skull of the other one. The lower image is the same one after a good linear registration. You can see that everything is roughly in the same space, but you should always consider that linear registration is a linear transformation. You're not going to have images that are perfectly matched. The ventricles are going to be different. There's going to be a lot of pathology, especially when you have disease populations. So you should have that in mind when you're quality controlling your linear registrations. Nonlinear registration. In linear registration, we were applying a transformation constant, a simple scaling or shearing or um, translation or rotation for all of the voxels consistently. 
nonlinear registration actually does voxel level alignment to try to locally and uh, work um, to do the alignment in a local voxel level. Why do we do this? Um, because uh, like, if you think about it, basically, if you have a perfect nonlinear alignment, what it means is that your nonlinearly registered image is going to look exactly as your target image. So the first image on the um, left column is the image that we want to register is a frontal temporal dementia patient brain. The image on the right, this is the average template that we want to use as our registration target. And the middle image is the nonlinearly registered image. In nonlinear registration, it's not the registration, um, the registered image that we are interested in. We do want to generate it to quality control our nonlinear registrations. We should always quality control all of our registrations, linear and nonlinear. But the registered image is usually not what we are looking for. It's the transformation that gets our first image, linearly registered image, to our nonlinearly registered image. That's what we are interested in because that transformation actually reflects how much is each voxel has changed to make the two images match. Deformation-based morphometry is basically this, using this idea. It's trying to reflect how much is each voxel is trying to deform to match a specific template or, or data from image from different visits from the same subject, for example. So you end up with maps like this, that for example, in subjects that have a lot of atrophy, you have very high values that reflect expansion in the ventricle and the, in the sulci, and then you end up with um, shrinkage or voxels that have lower values in other regions. You can do the same thing with um, different data from different time points from the same subject. This is again a frontal temporal dementia subject that scanned three times um, at one year intervals. And what you can do is um, generate a subject a specific average and nonlinearly register all images to that and do deformation based morphometry to look to see how much regional change has happened. If you look at the ventricles of this subject um, in each time point, you can kind of tell that they are getting bigger, but deformation based morphometry basically allows us to say, okay, locally where, which is, which region is getting bigger more. And you can see, for example, um, horn of the right ventricle is where you have the most uh, expansion and um, basically, the middle, you can also see that the middle image is the one that is most similar to the average of the tree, which means that it's mostly a linear process that's happening, at, at least in the two years of data that you have for this subject. So each of these different image processing steps can give us a lot of information about the data that we have. Um, I mentioned that you can do nonlinear registration and information-based morphology to your entire um, compared to an average template. And then what you can do is do, uh, as Yashar was mentioning, you can do some sort of um, statistical model to see overall patterns of atrophy, for example, in your population. This is, um, again, data from frontal temporal dementia patients compared against controls. And you can see that you can clearly pick out the patterns of atrophy, first of all, that they are mostly happening in the frontal regions, as opposed to the back of the brain. And you, you can see expansion in the ventricles, you can see um, atrophy in the um, gray matter and white matter areas. So these are helpful methods that you can use. So what's different? When we are doing image processing and quality control uh, in aging and neurodegenerative disease populations specifically, what are the differences that we need to always consider when we are looking at our data? First of all, atrophy. As I mentioned, a lot of the different image processing steps are dependent on image intensity distributions. So when you have so much atrophy or lesions um, that the distributions are not what you would expect in normal populations, it might be that they increase failure rate. Um, some studies show that great white uh, matter contrast ch can change as people age. So that might also impact your, for example, segmentation, um, tissue segmentation pipeline results. And 
older people, people with more um, cognitive problems, dementias, um, they move more. So if you end up quality controlling for motion at the level that you are quality controlling for motion, let's say in a very young adult population that didn't have any pathologies, you might exclude a lot of the subjects that had any problems and then you would bias your data. So what can go wrong? Everything. Each of the steps that I talked about can go wrong. So you should always think about what can go wrong and expect things to go wrong and basically try to figure out how to uh, make sure we get the best quality features out of this data as possible. So one of the main things that you need to always think about and consider is that almost all of the image processing pipelines that we use are developed based on data from healthy young ad uh, adult subjects or data from synthetic images that don't have any pathology or lesions or vari variability or data that comes from a single scanner or with a single acquisition protocol. So chances are most likely this data is not going to match the data that you have, especially if you're using data from like multi-center data sets like ADNI or NAC, then there's going to be a lot of variability in your data that you need to consider. Um, these pipelines might not work well for all of the um, scanners, for example, or sequences. The other thing that you need to consider uh, is that uh, there is always, uh, you're always, always going to have more problems when you're looking at the data from older individuals, patients that have different types of pathology and multi-center data. So let's go back to, each of the steps of the Im uh, image processing steps that I talked about and talk about what can happen when you're using that same tool in, a, in an older or um, disease population. The first step was linear registration. Linear registration, most linear registration pipelines are very intensity based. They try to match the intensity histograms of your um, source image and target image. What happens when there is a lot of variability, a lot of difference between the two images because of presence of pathology or um, a lot of atrophy? What ends up happening is that um, the local optima that the optimization method converges to might not be the actual good registration that you want to look at. So basically, this was the experiment that we did. Uh, we applied 10 different 10, nine different linear registration pipelines to data from 80,000 subjects uh, from different um, databases of aging and disease populations. And I visually QC'd all of them. <laughs> and basically what we did afterwards was try to see, okay, is there any difference in the failure rate for subjects that are older? Is there any differences in failure rate for people that have more atrophy, that have more white matter hyper intensities, um, that have larger ventricles. And basically the answer was yes. People that have more pathology in general or are older um, are more likely to fail linear registration, most linear registration pipelines. If you use um, an average template that is based on healthy normal populations. So as I said, always quality control, make sure the data is good. And I should also try to explain what these images are. Um, these images are quality control images that I like to use. Each person uses a different um, type of QC image to look at, but basically um, here, I, here I overlay the contour of the target image, which is my average template, which is DICBM MNI tem template on the register, the linearly registered image, and then try to see if the contours actually match between the average template and the brains, the subject's brain. And you can see in the um, first image on the top that 
they they overlay very well. And in, in the second one, you can see that the scaling is off. So um, the images are not aligned well. I use the same images for nonlinear registration. And basically, um, the idea for nonlinear registration is that they should almost perfectly match, not considering presence of white matter hyperintensities. So you can see again that in the top image, there is a very good correspondence between the outlines of, for example, the ventricles and the uh, ICBM contour. And in the second one, um, you have a clear failure because the subject's ventricles were too large and the, the, the nonlinear registration tool couldn't um, correctly deform the image enough to match the ICBM. So this is again another study that we did. And basically what we did was to nonlinearly regi non register subjects with different types of um, di frontotemporal dementia to uh, as well as age match controls from the same population to ICBM <coughs> template, which is a template of average template of healthy normal people. And what we saw is that as in the, in the populations that have more pathology, there is more registration failure, as you would expect. So how to, uh, how to make this better? How to do better in when you have problems with neural nonlinear non or linear registration? You can always use more appropriate templates. Uh, there are a lot of, um, more recently, there are a lot of average templates that are developed based on Alzheimer's patients, age, aged individuals, Parkinson's disease, different type, and people with different types of pathologies. And what you can, use, you can do is use these templates for your linear or nonlinear registration targets so that there is more similarity and the methods would perform better. Even if you want to use um, ICBM template as your end goal for registration, what you can do is use one of these templates as your intermediate registration target and register to that and then register to uh, MNI ICBM and improve your registration. The figure here on the right shows again, another person with a lot of atrophy and you can see that the nonlinear registration to ICBM template has clearly failed. But in the second step, what we did was to register it to an FDD template the same brain, and then register the um, image to ICBM template. Yeah. Well, why do you think that approach, like registration to a target rather than kind of some sort of group-wide approach more regularly? Like, so working with just what the data set that you have rather than looking for registration later? It might be that you're actually, for example, you want to do deformation-based morphometry comparing 10 different pathologies. Which one would you use? What I would suggest oh. is to, to use an average of the entire like population that you have registered to that and go with that. But if you don't have the capability to create your own average, average templates, then what you do is something that would be work for all of them or use an intermediate registration target. So another thing that is very near to my heart, white matter hyperintensities. So white matter hyperintensities are basically lesions, hyperintense signals on T2 and flare images. Why, why, and the reason we are talking about them today is that they appear hypointense on T1 weighted images. And this is a problem because usually it's gray matter that is hypointense on T1 weighted images. So the white matter hyperintensities would end up as random patches in your white matter that can be very close to gray matter areas and can have intensities, intensity values that are very similar to gray matter cortical or deep. So what ends up happening is that a lot of different um, segmentation pipelines that you have would just segment white matter hyperintensities as gray matter. These are the results of a few different pipelines um, when applied to data from um, subjects with a lot of white matter hyperintensities. And again, if you, if you study this consistently, this is something that happens. So how bad is this? Like, why, why would we care about this? Can we just QC this out? Not really. If you're looking at aging uh, and dementia populations, what you, you should always consider is that white matter hyperintensities happen more and more in aged individuals 
if you know that your 65 or 50 percent of your data has a lot of weight metal alkyl intensities, then just removing that um, part of the population would significantly bias your the results of your study. So the other problem is that we know that, for example, a lot of different dementias, such as Alzheimer's dementia, frontotemporal dementia, actually um, interact with cerebrovascular pathology, which means the white matter hyperintensities are part of the pathology that you're interested in studying. So if you end up excluding all of the subjects that have severe white matter hyperintensities, you're actually removing a large portion of your data set that is unhealthier and end up with a not representative part of your, your data set. So you should always think about that when you're processing your images. So what happens to downstream pipelines? Um, here is a free surface segmentation. In the, in the last row, you can see the overlap between what are intensity segmentations and cottage segmentations, for example. I'm talking about cottage here because cottage is located in, a loca in an area where white matter appearances happen very often. What ends up happening is that free surfer, for example, in, ends up segmenting a good chunk of the white matter appearances in that region as cottage. So you end up getting cottage uh, segmentations that are getting larger and larger in subjects that have more and more waste matter hyperintensities. I talk here about free surfer. Um, it's not that free surfer is the worst case, it's actually one of the better cases because within itself, free surfer tries to segment T1-weighted hypo intensities. So if you use other pipelines that don't even have this step, this would be worse. So do we, why do we care about this? We care about this because it's not just going to be a random noise in your data because, as I mentioned, for example, older people have more weight matter hyperintensities or people with Alzheimer's dementia have more weight matter hyperintensities. So what ends up happening is that this is systematic enough, this error, that is going to actually completely change the results of the analysis that you're um, doing. For example, if you do uncorrected and uh, correlations between uh, college volume and age, you end up getting positive associations. If you correct those results, you're going to get negative associations. So this is completely changing your view of the process that is happening. Again, if you look at Alzheimer's versus normal control patients, if you don't correct for the white matter hyperintensity presence, you end up getting positive differences and by that, I mean the AD people seem to have larger. Yes. What, what do you mean by correct in this context? So what we can do is we can segment the white matter hyperintensities based on T2 or flare, and then exclude that because we know it's white matter so as, as from the segment, gray matter okay. segmentation. So that's a lot. Yes. Of yes. Um, what does exclude mean? <laughs> add it back to the white matter mask. Okay. So you just you, you no. assign it back to the white matter. Yeah, because because the reason um, the reason T two and flare are very good for this is that they have they they are high point intense for gray matter. So you actually or flare doesn't have really much of a contrast for gray matter. So basically, if something is hyper intense on T two and flare, you know it's not gray matter. You know it's the lesion that you're segmenting as gray matter. So between the two of them, you can actually. Um, differentiate white matter hyperintensities from gray matter. And on that note, when you have multimodal modal data, when you have T12 flare images available, always use them. So yeah, um, back to my point, basically you can have two completely different results if you don't correct for cottage volume um, overlaps with white matter hyperintensities. If you don't correct, you can say, oh, my Alzheimer's pa patients have beer cottage. And then if you correct, you can see that, oh, the Alzheimer's patients actually do have much smaller colleagues. And this is going to impact your association with uh, associations with cognitive measures. For example, if you look at the relationship between colleagues volume and ADAS-13, which is a measure of cognition in ADNI, you're not going to see any association if you don't correct, but you are going to see a negative association um, showing that people with um, smaller colleagues have worse cognitive performance um, in ADD. 
Another um, image processing pipeline that is very popular that is going to be really impacted by presence of white matter aqua intensities is cortical thickness. So as I mentioned, white matter aqua intensities can happen anywhere. And by th that includes adjacent to the cortex. So most, um, most, uh, most cortical thickness pipelines start from a tissue classification uh, and then refine the um, results to get to the cort um, cortical surfaces. So what ends up happening is that if there is an error in the tissue classification results because of the white matter hyper intensities, then that error is going to be transferred to your cortical um, surfaces and cortical thickness measurements, and you're gonna end up having weird results or incorrect results. So can, what, what can we do? There are actually pipelines that allow you to correct your tissue classification uh, mass in the beginning and then rerun the pipeline. So this is FACON, um, a pipeline, one of these pipelines by, um, you, can, you can talk to Vlad if you want to use FACON. Um, I'm not advertising, but basically this is back on before and after correcting for presence of white matter hyperintensities, again, in frontotemporal dementia, um, in a frontotemporal dementia data. So you can clearly see um, the differences in the patterns that you're getting. And before correction, we weren't, for example, getting any differences in the frontal areas, which is where we know um, the atrophy largely is for frontotemporal dementia patients. And, things improve after white matter hyperintensity correction. So take home messages, always quality control your data. Make sure you know what's happening. Uh, make sure you know if there are um, artifacts and quality control your data in different steps. You need different quality control processes for linear and nonlinear registrations than um, presence of artifacts or for segmentations. Know what image processing pipelines you're using. What are the underlying steps? Is the image processing pipeline that you're using based on a tissue classification or a linear or nonlinear registration? That way you can know what to expect to go wrong. Use better pipelines if you can. If there are pipelines that have been developed or at least validated in data from aging and dementia populations, it would be worthwhile to use those pipelines to get better and more accurate results. Always think about what, how different types of errors might impact your results. When you're getting a um, result that doesn't make sense to you, think about what could have gone wrong. What are the failures in different image processing or pre-processing steps that might have led to errors in your features that might give you weird results. For example, if you're seeing that your call rate is getting bigger in your disease population, maybe you should think about whether this is something that is caused by errors in your image processing pipelines, or is it something that is actually happening in your data? Yep. Fair scan to identify white matter hyper intensities, or is it possible and valid to use a standard T2 scan? Additionally for T2 flare, or standard T2, are there any semi-automated approaches for labeling white matter hyperintensities that you would recommend? <laughs> would you, is there anything you recommend? <laughs> so I, my PhD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question is, um, is there any white matter hyperintensity segmentation pipeline that would work with T2 images and not FLIR? So to answer this, I should first mention that, L, well, at, at this point, you can safely say, most of the white matter pregnancy segmentation pipelines that are publicly available right now work with flare images because flare images are the easiest. Um, these flare is the easiest sequence um, to segment white matter intensity from. But yes, I um, my main PhD work was to develop a white matter hyperintensity segmentation pipeline that works with different sets of. Um, sequences, and by that I mean just with T1, with T1 and T2, T1 and T2 and flare, T1 and flare, any of the different combinations, basically. And that pipeline is publicly available. Um, so you can always download it and try to use that pipeline. 
not to be advertising, but yeah, I do have a neuro image uh, paper in uh, from 2017 that um, explains, describes the pipeline and has the link for the tool to be downloaded. I have one question about uh, your QC kind of concerns. So how do you differentiate the bias that is incurred by maybe a bit more lenient if you want to control uh, and then systematically biasing with the type of artifacts that you want there versus you're not having enough representation of the data set that you actually have? So you can always go back and look at the other features that you have. For example, if you go back and look at the failed versus past images and age of the subjects, or you, you can look at, uh, look at it to see if you're failing Alzheimer's patients a lot more than the normal controls, or you're failing people that have worse cognitive performance more than the ones that you have that have better cognitive performance. This is something that you should verify in general, but this is this is not something that is a solved problem like you, you you always there's always a compromise with between how good your mri features are and how much you're biasing your population when you're looking at disease populations As, especially with regards to motion they move like they forget they are in the scanner they are uncomfortable obese individuals move a lot more in the scanner. And on that note, if you're collecting your data yourself, if there is anything you can do to improve the quality of the images, don't imagine everything can be magically process, Im image processed out. So if you can talk to your subjects and explain to them how much motion is too much motion, which is any motion, <laughs> this, this actually helps. Like we've tried to um, talk to, and by we, I mean um, the, the people that were collecting the data in uh, obese individuals that had a lot of motion in the initial data set that they call it, collected, um, talking to them actually helps explaining to them. Uh, or if there is any additional process that you can do to make, uh, make them more comfortable and try to make sure that they, um, the quality of the images that they are collecting is best. So thank you, Massa, for a wonderful talk. Uh, and there's going to be a student lunch uh, right after this. So for those of you guys who signed up, uh, it'll be in the CIC conference room. Thanks again, Massa. Great talk.